Hello, friends. I'm Lee Brown. You've landed on Crazy Shit in Real Estate. Today's guest, Dan Habercost, goes speechless at the very end because I'm a busybody. But in the meantime, you're going to learn so many good insights on what it looks like to be a genuine hearted investor doing really good things in a community. You're also going to get a little dose of why local politics matter. So enjoy this conversation. Of course, all of Dan's contact information is in the show notes for this episode, and I'll see you on the other side. Dan, welcome to the show, and thanks for coming on to chat with my audience a little bit. Nice to meet you. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Looking forward to talking through business a little bit and hopefully providing some value. Perfect. Well, tell my crowd where you're located, how long you've been in and around real estate, any of those little details that will give them Dan's backstory. Sure. So I'm in Colorado Springs, Colorado, but uh, yeah, originally from Ohio. Uh, I came out here to visit my brother actually uh, in 2018 and it took me about a day to decide to move. Uh, but anyways, yeah, my first experience in real estate was actually when I was 16 years old. Uh, I was managing a farm and then my boss would go out of, out of the country for a good portion of the year and he'd give me his rental properties to manage as well. And yeah, wait, wait, wait. he let a 16 year old manage while he was out of the country. You know, I started working pretty young. And at that point, anyone who knew me trusted me pretty, pretty implicitly. So, yeah. Um, I mean, I have two teenagers in my house. I love them. I trust them. Not that much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I, you know, I had older siblings and older cousins. And so I don't know, there wasn't much of a childhood there. But uh, anyways, uh, so yeah, I, I was doing that. And that taught me about the type of real estate I did not want to own. He had a confrontational dynamic with his tenants. He didn't take care of the properties very well. And it was just constant problems. I remember when uh, one fall, in a humid, hot Ohio fall, I was ripping up a carpet covered in some sort of animal feces. And yeah, <laughs> that definitely did not make me want to get into real estate investing, but that was my first experience with it. Uh, fa uh, fast forward through, through high school and college, worked a number of different jobs while going to school. And then it was around 2021 where I, I saw myself falling kind of in the same path that everyone else in my family and really that I grew up around did, which was just going to school getting some job they hated, working for someone else. You know, my older sister's an architect and works 80 hour weeks and doesn't really make much money contrary to prior, what most people think. Uh, and so I said, okay, well, how do I take all this experience I have and start some sort of business or do some sort of investing that will allow me not to have to work for the next 40 years uh, for a low wage? And so I started reading different books, read about equities, investing. And then like everyone else, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And it was just like, click, you know, the light bulb went off. Uh, so yeah, I was 21 at that point and I was in college. I was working full-time at a landscaping company, going to school full-time and I bought a duplex, uh, cause you know, I was bankable. I had a full-time salaried income. Um, and that was in Parma, Ohio. So right outside of Cleveland. And then it was shortly after that, that I moved to Colorado, bought another house hack out here, was still working at a job, but it was around that time that I realized, Hey, the low and no money down stuff is great for buying maybe a property or two, but in the long run, if I want to build a portfolio, I need to figure out how to make a substantial income. Plus, I was it was pretty clear at that point that I, I just couldn't work for someone. I just absolutely hated it, even if I was you know given given freedom over my time and, and such. But uh, so yeah, fast forward to today, I have a land and development business, which is front range land, and that's a mix of buying and selling lots and then building on some of them, and then that feeds the passive investing. Um, and we can get into that. It sounds a lot more intelligent in hindsight, but it was really just a matter of stumbling along and, and kind of finding or figuring it out as I went. Well, I would say that a lot of people, their, their biggest hang up for getting into real estate investing is they just don't have a lot of cash. And so they have this hang up of, A, they don't know how, but money becomes the biggest excuse for not learning how. Mm -hmm. It's, I don't have enough money to do this. You have to have 25% down, real estate's expensive, my market's expensive. There's every excuse in the world. Mm -hmm. So you're obviously much younger than a lot mm -hmm. of people who have gotten started in this stuff and you're already ahead of the game. How did you get past that fear at the very beginning? Now, obviously you did one of the smartest mm -hmm. things ever and I wish more people would remember this when they're buying that first property. Your first property should be a duplex, a triplex, yeah. a quad, because then you've built-in income and you still get that owner-occupant treatment, it's the a most overlooked opportunity mm -hmm. in the business. But beyond that, how did you get, get past your fear to, to go step out and do some things? 
Yeah, that, that's a great question. And you never fully get past it. I, I, you know, we all become our parents in some way or one way or another. And I keep catching myself being like my dad. I'm definitely a worrier. And he was the same way. But I, I think as cliche as it is, it's really a matter of the reason that you want to do it being stronger than that, that fear. And, and for me, again, seeing the paths that many of the people I grew up with took, I, that's just, no, I, I don't, I don't care if I'm afraid I'm going to go figure it out. And also thinking through the uh, what could go wrong and planning for it is a big part of that because when things go wrong, you have a plan, just like when people constantly talk about, well, Hey, you know, is the market going to crash? Well, I don't know for sure, but I do know that I have a plan. I put aside reserves. I set up my personal financial situation in a certain way. So I feel more comfortable about continuing to do business, even though we're in a wild market. And the same would apply just for getting started. And I'm glad you you emphasized the house hacking part because that's such a low risk way to get started. It's almost like training wheels for investing because you, know, you got to live somewhere. So you're going to be paying rent and or mortgage one way or another. And so if you go and buy a duplex or even a big single family house and rent out all the rooms or the extra unit and cover most or if not all your mortgage, it, it just gives you freedom to pursue other things. And that, that for me was a big part of what allowed me to leave my job and get my active business started. So once I had moved out here, I had the duplex in Ohio, and then I had a big single family house out here that I was house hacking, I had no living expenses. And so it was because of that, that I was able to leave my job and go pursue you know, building front range land. So uh, really, it, it comes down to uh, proper planning and then also just having a, a strong motivator for doing it in the first place. Because if you don't, you're not going to deal with this. I love, I love the title of your podcast because all too often, those of us who've been in business for a while talk as if everything goes well all the time because we're just used to it. But the reality is you're going to get kicked in the teeth nonstop all the time. That's the only thing that's guaranteed. So um, yeah, proper planning and, and having clear motivation for why you're doing what you're doing. And for those of y'all that aren't super hip or haven't listened to the whole archive of episodes, which you should totally go back and listen to some about house hacking. That's what us older people used to call renting out a room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But young people call it house hacking. And essentially, if you buy a four bedroom house, Dan lives in one, rents the other three bedrooms out and Shazam, it will more than pay for itself. Mm -hmm. And we see this all over the marketplace. And especially now that there's such a shortage of rentals and rooftops, it's a more creative way to find housing, especially if you're single or if you're, mm -hmm. say, travel nursing or you're a contractor type person who really just wants to lay your head down at night. It can work. And so yeah. it's something that is well worth keeping on your radar. One of the things to keep in mind, though, is if you buy a property in a neighborhood, check the covenants and restrictions mm -hmm. and make sure the HOA isn't going to come beat down the door when some yes. nosy Nelly neighbor gets mad. All right. So let's talk about front range investing a little bit. How did you go from the house hacking slash multifamily to land? Was mm -hmm. that an accident or mm -hmm. did somebody introduce you to it? How did that happen? Yeah. So, so keep in mind, I think about these as being completely different buckets, right? Front range land is just an active business to create income that can then be put towards the long-term investing. So I see those as two, two different buckets. And uh, within the first couple of weeks of moving to Colorado, I went to the local meetup and I actually host that meetup now. Uh, but at the time I did not. And I met a guy who had been doing land and development all over the Western half of the country for the last 40 years. And he wanted help in his business. And I remember him, he, he stood up in front of everyone. So everyone had the same opportunity. Hey, I need help with such and such. Come, come down. He, he lived about an hour south of Colorado Springs. Come down, help me on weekends, and I'll teach you what I know. And I went down there and only one other person out of the whole real estate meetup took the initiative. And he gave up after a week or two. And I remember it was so clear to me. He just started showing me some of the projects he had going and a house he had being built and so on and so forth. And I'm like, this guy knows everything that I want to know. And so that that was my original intro into land specifically uh, and building of houses. And, and really, I just every weekend would drive an hour, go work with him, learn from him. And eventually we started doing business together. And uh, now we're just friends and invest together. So uh, yeah, that's what initially got me into land specifically. Okay. Well, we're in a marketplace right now and we don't know when the market's going to cool off, we just know that it will at some point because mm -hmm. real estate is a living, breathing thing that goes through good cycles and sideways cycles and then mm -hmm. rough cycles. And it's just going to happen, friends. Quit thinking this always goes up. Yeah. So when you're planning for a 
future and you happen to already be a worrier and you're setting aside your reserves, knowing mm-hmm. the market's going to change, when you've got a land business that funds another real estate business with investments on two ends and you're doing some building and developing, what are you doing right now to position yourself for any changes in the market, whether they're good, bad, or in sideways? Yeah. They're, okay. I'm trying to bookmark because I have a lot of different responses I want to make to that each in my head here. So first and foremost, my personal living expenses are very low, right? I, I'm buying a nice house. I'm done with the roommate house hacking, but I'm still going to have the oh, kitchen. Did you get married? Did you fall in love? And she's uh, well, live with other people? We're not married yet, but yeah. So I'm moving. Yeah. That may have something to do with a, a woman. Yes. Yes. It, the women happy. That's a rule in life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it definitely has something to do with her. Uh, but anyway, so we're, we're moving in together, but I, I told her we're still going to rent out. I, I'm having the basement kitchenette put in. It'll be its own unit. That'll cover a big portion of the mortgage and then take my other rentals and add those in. And that just about covers all living expenses alone. So I'm not really dependent on the active business. Then additionally, I always keep a good chunk of cash in the bank. And then with the the land, the, the time of exposure is so brief on the flips because I'm closing on these and reselling these usually within a few weeks, sometimes a few months. And when I sell them on notes, right, where I carry the financing, I make sure they're down payment gets all of my capital and or almost all of my capital out. And then the builds with those, there's a couple things that I do and think about or think through that, in my opinion, hedge against risk quite a bit. So number one, I'm building a very entry level product, 1500 square foot, 322 uh, ranch. Yep. That appeals to the largest demographics currently in the country, which are retiring baby boomers, first time millennial home buyers. And I, as I think anybody under 80A too, I think that's a, a market people forget about that those who have mobility issues, mm. they're pretty much restricted to a ranch. So you talk about broadening your market. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great point too. And I, I think a lot, okay, if the market does crash, the boomers are still going to want to retire. A lot of them are st- would even be more uh, likely to downsize and move to a smaller product. And I mean, not less expensive markets relative to the surroundings. And so I feel pretty safe building that product. And then additionally, just pairing the land investing with the build. Okay. I get the land at 30, 40, 50 cents on the dollar that creates a margin. Then there's already a significant margin on the build. And so just the more spread that you have between your, your, your cost and the, the sale, it just creates more margin of safety. Cause if things go wrong, I can drop the price a lot and still cash out. And so, uh, oh, and then along with that too, is I only try and finance one build in my name at a time. Uh, I just get partners, give up some of the profit and then do others with with partners. And so those are the things I think about uh, as far as hedging risk of the recession. So are you only building in Colorado so you can keep your eyes on it? I am right now. I am heading down to Florida uh, here soon. I've been flipping some lots down there and there's a market where I might get some builds going. We'll, we'll see. Well, that's the land of freedom and it's probably going to be the hot market for a while. Plus the top three fastest growing states are Florida, Texas, and North Carolina. So yep. we're places too. So if I were going to look for lots and do what you do mm-hmm. myself, how do I find these people and how are you reaching out to them? Are you sending letters in the mail? Do you go visit with them? How do you let mm-hmm. them know that you're not some skeezy scam artist? Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. So we have a, a frequently asked question sheet with the whole process and then the uh, title agent contact info right on it. Yeah, that has been, uh, that's the first thing I have my acquisitions managers send to sellers uh, because, hey, you don't have to trust us. We're using a title company and we can't, you know, going through a title company, they're the trusted third party. You don't have to worry. Uh, but yeah, it took a lot of, a lot of deals before I realized, hey, I should probably make this. So anyways, again, I sound a lot smarter in hindsight. Uh, so, we all do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You're just kind of stumbling every day, learning as you go. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so, so zooming out big picture, start with parts of the country that are growing. That's, that's what I do. And to make a distinction, yeah, like, like North Carolina, Florida, Colorado, it's, it started to taper off because it's gotten so expensive here. But the last decade, Colorado has been booming. Um, so start with the places that are growing. And then to make a distinction, I don't deal with large raw parcels of land. I like the infill lots because they're so simple. So everything that I'm working with, utilities are in place, zoning's done, right? There is an enormous amount of work that somebody did to get the land to that 
that place, right? So pick Colorado, for example, uh, to, to make a contrast out east of the airport of Colorado Springs, there's big developers taking huge tracts of land, going through all the work to subdivide and zone and bring in utilities. We're talking millions of dollars, years of time and exposure. That's not what I'm doing. I'm going after the lots that somebody did that a long time ago. And so all the markets I've had success in were subdivisions done decades ago that did not get built out. They, they essentially failed uh, originally. And so first, again, to back, back up here, find where people, where the areas that are growing, then find these subdivisions that are getting built out. And the easiest way to do it, I like to go on Zillow, pull up solds, new homes, and then look, where do I see yellow dots everywhere if I'm looking for a new market, right? It's amazing. It's, it's actually pretty simple. And then start to talk to people locally. That, that's been one of the biggest resources too, is just people pointing me in the right direction. Um, as cliche as it is, networking is really valuable. Um, and then from there, yes, sending letters. Uh, so there's kind of a, a cycle I go through. Uh, I have a handwritten mailer sent with an actual offer inside, cycled out with a postcard, and then also cold calling as well now has been added. And, and that's how I get in touch with them. And it's really straightforward. The offer is right on the, the letter and or postcard just says, you know, hey, I see you on such and such lot. We pay X amount. If interested, call. That's it. So really simple. And then that pretty much only gets us in touch with motivated sellers, too. Exactly. Because somebody's not interested, we'll just throw it away and not worry about it. All right. So this is crazy shit in real estate. We always yeah. like to hear a story from the trenches that totally goes against the HGTV narrative. And since you've worked in multiple spaces, I'm really curious to hear what kind of a story you decided to bring to us today. Yeah. Oh, man. I have so many I'd love to tell. Um, I think the most uh, fun one to tell will be with the recent rehab. This episode is sponsored by Follow Up Boss, one of the leading CRMs, client relationship managers for residential real estate. Tons of top producing agents and some of the fastest growing teams out there are using Follow Up Boss to increase lead conversion, eliminate busy work that you're not doing anyway, and frankly, deliver a higher class experience in real estate to everybody who chooses you as their realtor of choice. Follow Up Boss is going to take the names and phone numbers and also help you know what to do next so you can maintain these relationships with your neighbors because that's what this is about. Real estate is not about serving just prospects and clients. It's it's about taking great care of your neighbor's needs in real estate. Truly, it's going to change your business when you start paying better attention to people. They don't have to know you use Follow Up Boss, but they'll totally understand that they are being heard by you. And frankly, because you're my people and we made an ask for you, Follow Up Boss said, yes, you get double the free trial. That's actually enough time to log in, put some pieces in it, and watch it change your business as it has for so many realtors and teams nationwide. Again, go to followupboss.com slash crazy easy to start your free trial today. So a rental I bought at the end of last year, um, it was an old house in Colorado Springs that was really, really neglected. But we got it at, we got it at a great price, 100% owner financing, 3% permanent mortgage, right? So that's, that's a killer deal. And he actually did 3% uh, interest only for the first two years. And so, so hang on, hang on. So he owned the house that was a hot mess. Mm -hmm. And he financed it to you? Yeah. Was it vacant? No. Or, or yes, it just came up as being vacant. Excuse me. Yes. Yes. So how, I don't, under, I don't understand. So he, yeah. didn't, he just didn't care anymore? Was he, yep. Not caring? A wealthy old landlord. Him and his wife were at a point where they just didn't, yeah, they had really let it go. And plus the last tenant was gross to put it frankly, and had just let the house go. You walked into this thing and you almost fell over because the main Beam was four inches higher than the walls. <laughs> right in then. Yeah. And that might give you some investor fatigue. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. And so anyways, he, uh, he spends the winters in, in Arizona. He didn't want to stay up here to deal with the rehab while, because this was last fall going into winter. And so time was far more important than money to him. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, 3%, two years interest only, at which point it converts to a 15 year AM 3% permanent mortgage. Uh, so Killer deal as far as that goes. I have a con well, a handyman that I've used for years and years, and he's been fine. He's always been a little quirky, but he's been great. Uh, does very good work. And we hired him to do the rehab. Had not hired to do such a large project up until this point, but 
Long story short, we're in the middle of replacing the sewer and water line. The whole front yard's excavated. And this is an infill, you know, quarter acre postage stamps lots. So the whole front yard is dug up. We want to do this as quickly as we can. And I get a call from his assistant. His assistant's going crazy. Dan, I, I don't know what happened. Jeff got arrested. <laughs> I'm like, what? Yeah, Jeff, Jeff got arrested. He's gone. Anyways, so there I am, you know, with a million other things going on. The whole front yard's excavated. Sewer line replaced or water line replaced. Sewer line is not replaced. And there's just dirt everywhere. And I got a 20 year old kid just not sure what to do with the machine still on site. So I finally, yeah, I finally, I get, I'm able to get them on the phone and uh, they're not setting bail for, I want to say like a week, like a week. What did he do? I I still am not completely clear. He had, I, I believe in hindsight, he has issues with alcohol. And I think that that, I think he's a good guy. He just is an alcoholic. That, that seems to be uh, in hindsight what the issue is. So anyways, had to scramble to get someone over there to finish the sewer line, cover up the hole, and then ended up meeting him at, at the local jail the next morning because I needed an update. There's all these things half done and it's all in his mind. I don't know how to communicate to anyone. Uh, anyways, meet him at the county jail. He starts bawling his eyes out in front of me. No one had come to visit him. And he had no one helping him. So I gave him some money uh, on his account. Yeah, yeah. This was just, this was, good job. This was so uncomfortable. So I gave him some money on his account. And then a week later, I finally get to bail him out. So I go to a, uh, gosh, I learned all about the bail system, which was new to me, thankfully. (laughs) Don't watch Jackie Brown, because if you watch that Quentin Tarantino movie, you can learn about the bail bond system. Okay. Well, I I did. I learned a little bit. And I put up the money to get him bailed out and then took it out of his, uh, his pay. And got him out and he continued along. And then uh, that actually wasn't, oh, go ahead. No, I was just saying, oh. Yeah. Well, we, in hindsight, this is probably my fault for having hired him in the first, it is my fault for having hired him in the first place, but it is what it is. There were so many things undone and half done. The idea of trying to get a new contractor in there would have just been an absolute nightmare. Um, So anyways, yeah, got him out. He just about finished the house and then there ended up being drama right as the new tenant was moving in and there were some undone things as the tenant moved in. So that wasn't fun, but that that's the most recent drama I've dealt with as far as, as rentals, but I could go on. I uh, got a moratorium on build permits in my primary market. So we could talk about that too. Oh, that just makes me angry, but we will actually talk about that because that's a legislative and regulatory issue, but I got to point out, the Bible tells us we are supposed to take care of those that are in prison. And so you did what you're supposed to do. So I got extra high fives and props on that, because one day when you have some little people in your house, you're going to have to teach them to take care of the aliens Mm. the and the widows and to go visit in prison because it look what a difference it made for him that you still believed in him, even if his work was, shoddy and there were things that you didn't know about i mean <laughs> yeah he came and did a little project at just my house and I, I i keep finding extra things he did and fixed all over that i didn't even know about because he feels bad and he, he knows it, you know so anyways i think that'll have been worthwhile too in the long run i love him and i love you for doing that all right so <laughs> let's talk about regulatory issues and friends this episode is going to go a little long and y'all know how heated up i get about local politics but yeah this is easily the biggest fly and the ointment we have in the housing supply issue right now is not even the supply chain. It is our local municipalities Mm -hmm. and how they are handling zoning, how they're handling permits, how they're handling infrastructure. And you talk about some people who get a power trip. That is your local county commissioners and your planning and zoning boards and your city managers Mm -hmm. because they will respond immediately to one cranky person who shows up at the meeting screaming all their nimbyisms. Mm-hmm. And then they turn around and go to the media and talk about, Oh, there's no housing. Well, yeah. And yep. it's affordable. You should have said yes to the quadplex on that vacant lot because mm-hmm. people act like a duplex, a triplex, a quad is going to destroy a neighborhood. Actually mm-hmm. no, if it's got a lot that can hold it, that is an elegant way to increase opportunities. But anyway, tell us what happened in the county where you operate, because I do think that there's also an opportunity for other municipalities to get best practices as we find about ways to solve this and also to keep it from coming wherever they are. Yeah. Okay. So big picture, this is, we live in the desert out here. For those of you who have not been to Colorado, this side of the country is a desert and water is a constant problem. All of our, yeah, 
Water is going to be civil war. It ain't going to be stuff with Russia. It's going to be over water. You mark my words on that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think eventually we'll go the route of Dubai and figure out desalination, but not until we're pretty desperate. Um, I hope so, because that would be smart. But then again, expensive. Bureaucrats aren't known for being smart, but Gary. No, no. So, (laughs) okay. Water's an issue out here. Colorado specifically, all the snow that melts in the high mountains, that's what feeds our and the states around us water supply, right? We don't get any appreciable rain, any significant rain. It's all from snow melt. And so water's been a big issue. The snowpack's been been pretty low the last few years. Plus the county I'm in knew for, excuse me, the city I'm in knew for a long time that they were running low on water. But Governments aren't very forward thinking. They think in, you know, one, two, sometimes four year term limits. Uh, as far, yeah. So they were running low on water. The market I'm in started to grow very quickly and out of nowhere. I'm flying home from Florida just from a vacation. It was a great time. And you know, when you land and you suddenly get a bunch of text messages, right? Because you get service again. I was on a layover and all of a sudden my phone blows up as I land. I have all these texts from my acquisitions manager, from a friends of mine in the market. Something is horribly wrong. And to put it in perspective, I had six lots I'd already closed on, about $100,000 of cash in those. And then I had another three under contract and then three of the ones to buy. And then three of the ones that I owned were under contract to sell. So I have a lot in process just in that market with just lots flipping, let alone building. And all of a sudden, just like that, moratorium on new builds for the foreseeable future. And so this was in January. And so that was not a, not a fun day because a lot of ARs I was expecting to come in did not come in. So anyways, it was actually tomorrow that it looks like they're going to be lifting the moratorium. And what we're waiting to hear is the allocation of water taps, you know, how many they will do per unit of time, and then what the new cost will be. Uh, thankfully, Outlook is a little bit more positive than initially expected. So I've been able to sell a lot of those lots. I had a build that was grandfathered in and was building another market. So it's okay. But that was a a big pain in the butt because I expected to have several more builds going there. Haven't been able to flip as many lots. Um, so yeah, we will see what tomorrow brings and, and see if that will be a viable market at all going forward. And I'll just point out to all of you viewers and listeners, this is why if you're going to hire a realtor, you hire a local pro because mm-hmm. local people know these things have inside baseball mm-hmm. with what's happening in the cities and counties And while somebody from four hours away might be your best friend or your cousin's ex-wife and you love her, if she doesn't know what's happening in the county, then you could miss out on this kind of information, which is the difference between having something that's profitable and something that's a drain. It's crazy important. And by the way, friends, this is why you need to show up at county commission meetings and city council meetings, because that's where the information is disseminated. And I know it's boring, but you got to go. So I'm glad that you shared what's happening there. Have you seen those photos of Lake Powell here lately? Uh, Lake Powell, no, but other lakes that are severely down, I've seen. Right. So a lot of people from Colorado, of course, go to Lake Powell to vacation, like to over there in that whole Colorado River Valley. And it's just, it's so mm-hmm. low, it's frightening. Yeah. Because this has happened other times in life. The weather goes through cycles and that's normal. So we shouldn't all be panicking, but we should be wise about our resources. All right. So Dan, if somebody wants to be wiser and learn from you, what's the best way for them to contact with you? Yeah, just go in contact with you. Yeah. Social media, Dan Habercost, Instagram or Facebook. You'll see lots of pictures of projects I'm working on and then the mountains. And then soon to be the wedding, right? Uh, uh. Oh, whoa. I don't know. No, 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 no. Okay. We got a couple more years for that. <laughs> hey, hey, wait, wait. <laughs> I, she didn't set me up for that. I'm just a proponent of good people getting married and having babies and populating the earth. That's what we're supposed to do. Yeah. You're like, yeah. oh, God, no. <laughs> oh, no, no. Down the road. Uh, you know, I'm 25. I don't plan to have kids until I'm probably in my 30s, so. Um, do it when you're 30. Don't wait too long because okay. the older you get, the harder they are. I, okay. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. So thank you for coming on the show. I like Thanks how I got you completely speechless there at the end. So I saw <laughs> in. And friends, make sure that you are subscribing right here. Hit the bell. Give Dan some love in the comments and thank him for what he shared with you today. Most importantly, make sure you come back next time for more crazy shit in real estate. So if you found value in this episode, please like and subscribe to this channel, turn on the bell and catch another amazing episode by clicking above. Crazy Shit in Real Estate is also available on all of your normal podcast apps. 
So if that's where you like to hang out, go find me, click subscribe. And most importantly, leave me a review that says you think I'm awesome, my guests are awesome, or this content is just exactly what you were looking for. And then by the way, if there's something you need, you wanna learn about something, you can comment below anytime. You can also send me a direct message if you need to remain anonymous, no judgment. But anyway, I'll only judge if you forget to subscribe and click. I'll see you next time.